Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. A few weeks ago, I uploaded a video on the Royal Arms of England, which I'm going to link in a card up here. In that video, among other things, I discussed the way that an achievement of arms and its component and connected parts, so mottos, badges, emblazons, supporters, helms and crests, are all part of image making. They both show us how the outside world viewed an individual, but also how that individual wished to be seen by those around them. And for me, this is especially true if we look at Henry VIII and his six wives, particularly their badges and mottos. In today's video, I want to look at the badges and mottos for Henry and his queens, to look at the way that they were attempting to shape their political and marital identities. When Henry VIII came to the throne in 1509, his motto was the same as the monarchs that had gone before him and those that would come after him. God and my right. Because that was how he was in his place. He was placed on the throne of England by God and his own divine right. In terms of symbols or badges, Henry had access to a plethora. There was the Beaufort portcullis of his paternal grandmother, Margaret Beaufort. There was the Red Dragon, connected to Wales and the Welsh Tudors. Then there was the Greyhound, and many others besides. Although perhaps the symbol that we most commonly associate with Henry, and indeed his father Henry VII, is the Tudor Rose. And the Rose is in fact the national flower of England. But what does the Rose represent, and why is it used? Then as now, the Rose is an enduring, iconic symbol of love. It is for that reason that it is frequently given and received on Valentine's Day. However, on the Tudor rose, the roses of Lancaster and York brought together, in both cases, white and red rose have five petals. And these five petals connect to the Virgin Mary. They are seen as being representative of the five joys of the Virgin Mary's life. These being the Annunciation, when Mary hears that she will carry the Christ child, the Nativity, the birth, the resurrection when Christ comes back from the dead, the ascension of Christ into heaven, and the assumption, the ascension of Mary into heaven. The five petals are also taken to be representative of the five letters of her full name, Maria. The rose is also used to represent Christ. He is described as the rose without a thorn, and that imagery will come up later in Henry's marital career. However, in the case of the Tudor Rose, we are also seeing a narrative being shaped about the end of earthly strife. The Tudor Rose is also sometimes known as the Union Rose, as it represents the union of two previously warring family factions. Both descended out of the Plantagenet royal family, the House of York, represented by the White Rose, and the House of Lancaster, represented by the Red. When Henry VII, as the sole surviving Lancastrian claimant, however tenuous, came over to England and defeated Richard III at Bosworth Field, he went on to marry the daughter of Edward IV, Elizabeth of York. She was the White Rose and he was the Red, and together the Tudor Rose was formed, and it was personified in the children of their marriage. No more was the family at odds because they were unified by these children created out of both York and Lancaster. However, all is perhaps not as it seems with this, because while the White Rose of York was certainly a symbol that was used by that family, for the Red Rose, that was something that was more tenuously connected. It was definitely a Lancastrian symbol, but not the most prominent one. As Henry VII was ramping up his invasion of England, he decided to take this floral image on as his royal device. And it seems to me that he knows that this will make branding his new dynasty all the easier. That he knows in his red rose, he can join it up with his future wife's white rose and make a unified national symbol. When Henry processed his coronation in 1509, he was not alone. At his side was his brother's widow, now his wife, Catherine of Aragon. For her new role as Henry's wife and queen, she chose the motto, humble and loyal. Her badge was the pomegranate sometimes known better as the Pomegranate of Spain, a reference to her Spanish royal roots. 
but the pomegranate is also a fruit of many seeds, and thus it symbolises fertility and abundance. It is a device of hope. Catherine hopes to be the fertile mother of Henry's children. Alas, as history will tell us, this was not meant to be. For although Catherine did fall pregnant many times over their marriage, she produced only one child that would survive, a daughter, Mary. Catherine of Aragon's pomegranate is crowned, representing both her own royal heritage and her place in England as Henry's wife and queen. There is nothing to suggest that Henry and Catherine's marriage was anything other than completely happy when it first began. However, by the 1520s, and we aren't completely sure of the exact date, Henry's heart and mind have been turned to another, one of his wife's gentlemen of the chamber, Anne Boleyn. Perhaps it is because he becomes aware that Catherine has stopped menstruating, that she has gone through menopause, and so therefore he will not be having more children or any sons by her. Perhaps because of the very great love that it does seem that he bore to Anne Boleyn. Either way, he decides that his best course of action is to annul his marriage to Catherine so that he can marry Anne and make her his queen. In 1533, London witnesses the majestic coronation of Queen Anne Boleyn. As her motto, she chooses the most happy. Her badge is a crowned falcon holding a scepter on a tree stump from which red and white roses grow. The falcon was connected with the Earls of Ormond and this title was one which Anne's father, Sir Thomas Boleyn, felt he had a right to claim. Additionally, the falcon is a favoured bird of prey, known for its relentlessness in pursuing its quarry. Thus, it is potentially symbolic of somebody who will not give up until they have achieved their desires. The fact that it is crowned is symbolic of Anne's new royal status. The scepter is a sign of authority and again, of royal power. By placing this crowned falcon holding a scepter, on a tree stump from which flowers are springing, it seems that Anne is making a promise both to her king and her country. Henry's former marriage, his so-called false marriage to Catherine of Aragon, had produced only one surviving child, a daughter. The dynasty was therefore in danger of dying out. What Anne seems to be promising here is new life. The barren stump of the Tudor family is, through Anne, being given a new hope. Because, of course, she will provide Henry with the son that he craves. And indeed, at the time of her coronation, it would seem that all of these promises were about to be fulfilled because Anne was visibly pregnant. Surely it would be a son. As we know, as history turns out, she did no better than her predecessor. For the child she was delivered of, the one she was pregnant with at her coronation, was another girl, Elizabeth. And Anne would not produce another living child. Three years after her coronation, in 1536, Anne was back at the Tower for her trial and execution. Within days, her successor, Jane Seymour, was getting ready to become Henry's next wife and queen. Anne Boleyn was the last of Henry's wives to have a coronation, but she was certainly not the last to have a motto or a badge. When Jane Seymour became Henry's wife and queen in 1536, she chose as her motto, bound to obey and serve. As a badge, she chose a crowned phoenix emerging from a castle or tower. That castle or tower also has sprouting from it red and white flowers. The choice of a phoenix is peculiarly poignant and a little tragic. The phoenix is a symbol of regeneration, resurrection and new life. However, in order to resurrect, the phoenix itself must die. It must burn itself out so that new life can sprout. It is, of course, not thinkable that Jane would have known that by 1537 she would be dead, having provided Henry with the son that he so craved. But in the act of producing that son, she herself would be destroyed. Jane was the phoenix. She sacrificed her own life, it seems, so that Henry could get his son, Edward, and the Tudor dynasty and England could have their longed-for heir. Through the castle or tower in Jane's badge, we are shown steadfastness, security and safety. This is exactly what she provides to her new royal family, the safety and security of the promise of an heir. Additionally, in the crowning of her phoenix, it shows her royal position, although she herself never got a coronation. 
After Jane Seymour's death, Henry was a grieving widower. Within a few years, however, he had remarried. And between January and July 1540, he was involved in his brief abortive marriage to Anne of Cleves. As her motto, she chose, God send me well to keep. And as it would turn out, these were words that she would hope to live by. For her badge, she had a crowned golden escarbuncle. The crown is a ducal crown, representative of the fact that she comes from the family of the Duchy of Cleves. The escarbuncle itself is also a device connected to Cleves. However, it is tantalisingly different to the badges of those that have gone before her. In the escarbuncle that is both a shield and also representative of a precious gem, there is no promise here of children and generation. The shield is of course a protective force and if it represents a precious gem, then that's about value, that's about beauty, but not necessarily about children. However, perhaps the choice of this badge is a fitting one, particularly as we look back on her as historians, because it's just as inscrutable as the woman herself. What was she thinking? What motivated her? Was she happy, sad, frightened? All of these things are somewhat obscured, almost, it would seem, as obscured as the meaning behind her choice of badge. After annulling his marriage to Anne of Cleves, Henry moves on at lightning pace. From 1540 to 1542, his wife and queen is Catherine Howard. The motto that she chooses for her new role is, no other will than his, which sounds very obedient on paper, doesn't it? As a badge, she picks the Tudor Rose, or the Union Rose, crowned. So her device is the same as Henry's, all except for the stem. Catherine Howard's rose shows a stem with no thorns. For Catherine Howard was Henry's rose without a thorn, or at least so he thought. It would soon become clear that this was not what she was. She had been engaged in sexual relations before her marriage that she had not confessed, and it would seem that she had engaged in illicit relationships during her marriage to the king. Through her behaviour, Catherine jeopardised the royal succession. For all that her motto and badge promised, it would seem that Henry had been deceived by her. In 1542, she was arrested, attainted and executed for her behaviour. Nevertheless, Despite all this turmoil and upheaval, Henry is not quite done with matrimony just yet. In 1543, he marries again. His final wife and queen is a woman who has been twice widowed. This is perhaps fortuitous. No one's going to expect a twice widowed woman to be a virgin. Catherine Parr chooses as her motto to be useful in all that I do. She chooses as her badge a crowned maiden emerging from a Tudor rose. The crown, of course, represents her newly elevated royal status. But people have asked if the maiden is supposed to represent that Catherine was alleging that she was still a virgin, that her first two marriages had not been consummated. Certainly, they had not produced children. However, to accept or believe this is to overlook the fact that Catherine had as her patron saint, St Catherine of Alexandria, also known as St Catherine of the Wheel, the person who the Catherine Wheel of Bonfire Night is named after. St Catherine is the patron saint of scholars and philosophers. More recently, she is tied more explicitly as the patron saint of female learning. And this is so very fitting for Catherine Parr. It's almost like this is her manifesto, both for her marriage and her life, because she was educated and she was keen to see that others would be educated as well. As a two times published author, Catherine Parr would practice what she preached and promised through this badge. Through the lamentation of a sinner and prayers and meditations, Catherine Parr would show herself to be an educated, interested woman, keen to engage with the philosophical and religious problems of the day, and also a staunch proponent of religious reform. I believe that by looking at the mottos and badges of Henry's wives and queens, we are being shown just what they were promising Henry and England. Now, some of these badges and mottos seem to be startlingly prophetic. Some are tragic, ironically so. Some completely inscrutable, and others seem like an outright deception. I think they're fascinating, but I would love to know what you think. 
Also, if there's any other achievements of arms, mottos or badges that you'd like me to look at, then do let me know in the comment section down below or come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave the links to those in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then let me know by hitting the thumbs up button. Please also subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.